I'm Katy Perry, and this is After Earnings, a show that brings you face-to-face -face with the executives behind the world's most interesting public companies. And I'm Austin Hankwitz, and today we chatted with the CEO of Life360, Chris Holes. Yes, Life360, the app your parents use to track your location and everything you were doing when you were younger. Now, Chris was such a breath of fresh air. He actually rolled up to the interview holding a 7-Eleven coffee cup. He broke down his strategy for infiltrating TikTok and how we got 7 billion views on a hashtag, and he just kept it a buck with us the whole time. On a serious note, we learned more about why they IPO'd on the ASX years before now trading on the NASDAQ, the company's core values. We learned a little bit more about members before metrics, as well as how they morally sell de-identified aggregate data to help with traffic jams. That's right, we definitely talked about monetization. Just 13% of Life360 users are paying subscribers. The rest are free users. And it's interesting to think about teens on the platform now, perhaps reluctantly so, someday having their own Life360 accounts for their families and being paying subscribers. Chris also tells us about being a rule breaker as a CEO and how joining the military at age 17 helped shape him into the leader he is today. So let's get into it. Chris, welcome to After Earnings. It's great to have you here. Uh, I, I spotted a 7-Eleven cup, and I, I want to ask about that before we get into the interview. <laughs> this it's is the best first. coffee. I, you know, I, I as I've gotten older, I'm going to go way off topic. I was in college. I was going to the symphony and stuff, and I thought I'd get smart. I was like, you know what? I'm just not a cultured person. So the 7-Eleven is not only cheaper, it tastes better, and it's bigger. So there you go. That's that's how I feel. Do you listen to like country music? Like, do you have like a lot of Carhartt? Uh, I I am on my rural Canadian property now, and the stuff. funny thing with Carhartt is like, some people are you trying to be cool, Chris? It's like, well, no. Why? Well, you're wearing Carhartt. It's like, that's that's cool now, and I, I guess it is. But I, I I'm in a small town, a few hundred people, yeah. in a ranching town, and uh, it was all the rednecks wore Carhartt. Now it's completely changed. Well, they bifurcated the brand. So there's like ex more expensive Carhartt they sell in like Soho, New York. And then there's the actual workwear. Anyway, we're getting way off topic, but um, welcome to the show. We want to talk to you. You recently IPO'd. Talk about Life360. And to get going, uh, I read that this, this idea, the spark of idea came actually after Hurricane Katrina. So I would love to hear sort of how that a uh, seed of an idea came about and then how you built it. Sure. So there. the idea was Hurricane Katrina. I was still in college and it was obviously a huge tragedy and families just couldn't find each other after a big emergency and cell towers stayed up while landlines went down. And I had the idea, like, what about actually using text messages to help people find each other after big natural disasters? Uh, wasn't planning on working on the idea. Uh, we can get into the story about how I decided to pull the trigger later but we were seeing the smartphones were just about to come out. iPhone was out, or an Android had just been announced. There were no third-party apps on iPhone. Like, what if smartphones could be the way of knowing where people are? And our initial idea was very emergency-focused. But when we built our prototype, which was on it was lit an emulator, there wasn't even an Android phone yet. We're like, wait a second, there, this could be something so much bigger. And it just made sense. Like, sharing location is extremely powerful. It's like really a fabric of communication. And I didn't think it's creepy. One one thing. I, I, I've never cared about social graces or anything. And like, we just assume like some point this is going to be completely normalized. And it was the era of social networks for everything. And our thought was maybe the way to win the family network, which many people were trying to do, isn't like another photo sharing app or even organization service. What if it's around communication, coordination, and safety? And if everyone is a smartphone, that's a really great way to do that. Uh, ironically, I'm, I'm veering off a bit. The number one reason most VCs would pass on us in the early days was that teenagers would never have smartphones. Go figure. Oh wow. That's a crazy assumption. And I mean, I get it, right? Because I remember like, you know, back when the iPhone came out, my my uncle had it and he was super, you know, it's called him 40s and his 50s. He was much older than me. Um, and for for reference there, I was in, I think, seventh or eighth grade when the iPhone came out. None of my friends had smartphones, I don't think, until really. Actually, I remember the iPhone yep. 6 took my high school by storm. And that was... Gosh, 2000, maybe 12, 2013 right. there. Um, but then after that, I feel like everyone's yeah. kids already, you know, kind of started rocking into that. Yeah. So what a wild assumption. It kind of makes sense. How, how like it, what, was it a Bill Gates quote that um, people underestimate the change in one year, or overestimate in one year, underestimate in seven. So uh, 
most of these yep. big trends, they're only obvious in hindsight. And uh, you, you got to take many swings and misses. Think of all the things that we thought would be huge that haven't really panned out yet. And you can see where the world's going to go, though. Well, speaking of a swing, not a miss, more of a home run. You guys yep. just IPO'd. Uh, you guys are now on the yep. NASDAQ. Uh, you were private for more than 15 years. Yeah, we, Why now, right? Why from private for so long to yeah, this so is the only bit different. So we've actually been public for five years on the ASX. So we've always done things a little bit weird in our own way. So we, we have been, um, for all intents and purposes, a public company been legally for the last five years. Uh, so... The why now for the NASDAQ shift, though, was we're, we're a U.S. company. This is the right long-term home for us. Uh, we had a bit of a Goldilocks uh, situation with our share price. Not too low that we couldn't take some dilution. Not too high that no reasonable investor would invest. We can we can look anyone in the eye and pitch a really good upside story. Like This is a ubiquitous use case. Yes, there are, there are risks. But it's actually going from when people bring up like, okay, what are the risks? It used to be like, well, the market's too small. No one's going to use this. Like now the market is so big. This is going to be used by every person in the world. The biggest companies in the world are going to do this. How are you going to compete? So I think it's a much better position to be the risk point being your market's too big than too small. Uh, so uh, on that note, we want to have access to the deepest pockets when the market does shift back to a growth mode. Doing more M&A is, is definitely on the table. And it's the the right long term home, and we and we've always been very under the radar for our size, and so uh, being on the Nasdaq does I think come with some credibility for prospective employees. We're very focused on the the absolute best and brightest for the team, and when we were on the ASX or private, it was like Wait, this it doesn't really give you that same cachet, and not, not that, and there's probably some very small element of ego to it, but we really want to be recognized as where we are. We're the 14th biggest app in the country by DAU, and we want to get even bigger. No, I love that. And walk me through why you guys chose the ASX five years ago versus the NASDAQ. And, you know, sure. just give me the whole play by play. So there. backing up a bit, we were not an overnight success. Uh, we, we were way, way, way too early to the location trend, better early than late. Uh, and it was both the attitudes around location sharing and the technology uh, to make the app actually work well. So to your point on iPhone 6, a little bit different thing happened with us. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get the generations a bit wrong, but like early location apps just kill your battery. Even if the absolute best engineers, there's just no way you could do it. When they moved to on-chip accelerometers and just better chipsets in general, everything opened up. So like the ability to detect a crash, a car crash from the sensors on the phone, that was all like you needed the on-chip accelerometers to, to do that without clobbering your battery. So when it tipped, it tipped hard. But as a company, we had a bit of a messy cap table. I had no clue what I was doing when we got going. We had some strategics on the board that we wanted to shift off. We had some early uh, investors that wanted to get some liquidity. And at the time, the ASX was pitching, instead of like doing a Series D or CE, come here, get the benefits of being public a little bit earlier. You can be a big fish in a small pond, uh, get rid of the preference stack. And um, I guess I run a safety company, so it shouldn't be that surprising. I like to hedge a little bit. And uh, I didn't like the idea of, and I was a little suspicious of, companies with these huge headline valuations, but then you'd look at the underlying structure and it'd be like 2X participating preferred. You could get these wipeout situations. And so up through the end of 2021, that conservatism did not pay off. But like there are a lot of companies now that the, say you're a founder or something and you only sold for like $300 million, but you'd raise 300 and maybe you'd moved on. You got zero. And so we wanted to hedge against that downside. And the valuations between the ASX and the U.S. markets were, were very similar. Uh, we only had about $30 million of revenue, I think. Don't quote me on that at the time. So way too small. Now we're over 300. So we're, we're literally 10x the size when we started that process. Uh, it's before SPACs were a thing. Uh, but unlike SPACs, the ASX, was like it was like a real IPO. Now that I've done two borders, uh, across-border IPOs, in some ways the ASX process was more gr rigorous than the U.S. one. So it, it wasn't like a hack where you can kind of put lipstick on a pig and get it out. It was a way to go through that rigor a little bit earlier and, and get the benefits of it. That's awesome. I appreciate that breakdown, Chris. Yeah, that's the ASX is super interesting transitioning to the NASDAQ, especially in the context of our listeners, retail investors, because a lot of them today are actually learning about and discovering companies through their brokerages yep. first. And, you know, many of the brokerages don't offer uh, non-U.S. Uh, equities on there. And so it's 
Do you think that's going to be a uh, spur more retail investor interest just through pure discoverability? I think so. Potential? And somehow we had some OTC listing that even our lawyers didn't really know how that ended up there. So there were people doing an OTC trade. And if you guys know how that all works, and t tell me. So, but, but yeah, we have a lot of people doing it. Um, we do have a, a surprising TikTok following where Gen Z people are always asking how to buy shares. Like, I hate you, but I think my parents love you so much that I mean, this stock's going to go way up. So. Yeah, I don't know. Should we try to meme stalk ourselves? We guess we could. I mean, for I... sure. We appreciate the creativity. I think that's what this next generation of investors is is looking for. And it is, we talk a lot on the show about how it's kind of more like yep. marketing than IR. And uh, it seems like that's where your head's at. How much are you guys spending per year, um, I guess, to ensure that the sensitive data that you're collecting and sharing with your customers is like, always going to be protected, right? I, I know Apple, call it maybe four or five years ago, they switched to like yeah. Apple privacy, right? That was like a big marketing yeah. thing for them. Um, talk to me about your, the process around making sure that the data you collect and share yeah. with your customers because they want that data is entirely yeah. secure. So let's zoom out on data and privacy in general. I think there's like, the, what do we share just from forgetting about security, but more just what we feel comfortable with our partners and all that. And our working philosophy there is transparency and choice. Uh, we try to have plain English and tell people how we use their data. We think data can be used in good ways, even though it can be negative spin. Like one thing I'm really excited about is with people's permission, let our driving data rate your insurance. So if we're like, hey, Austin, you're in the top 23% of drivers, you'd be crazy not to have a usage-based policy. Like that's a really good use of sensitive data. We could even warn you like, hey, Katie, you like speed all the time. You actually probably don't want this. So we'd like to get to a point where, where we, sometimes with partners in a very customer safe way, can use your data to enhance products and services you get. Um, tying that into a little bit of an investor theme, we really looked at Credit Karma a lot. They're taking your absolutely most sensitive data. It's like you give them their social security number, your full name, your birth date, everything to steal your identity. What do they do? They share that with advertisers, but it's not in a bad way. They do it by matching you with their credit cards that are actually good for you. And, and because it's giving you value, people feel very comfortable about that, that exchange. So when you think about data, we're, we are a pro data company uh, when it's done in a pr transparent way that gives users choice. And I will never do anything to our customers that I wouldn't do myself. So I'm opted into everything in Life360. I like targeted ads. My joke, which is not really a joke, is like, it's, they're great because I get ads that I like, but if my wife's been using my computer, I get targeted with yoga pants. So that's, now I have two daughters that are getting old enough to, to use a computer, so I'm, I'm starting to see other weird ads. So, But anyway, I think targeted ads are good. So that's nothing to do with security. The security piece, though, is anything with payments is the stuff that's actually most sensitive. That's the stuff there's real dollar value. Uh, location data obviously is very private, but again, like you can't just get a phone book and find where someone lives. There's not actually a lot of financial value to a hacker, which is really where they're going after. Like, where can I get your, like, if you're a crypto company, you darn well better protect those keys with your life. So we're more of like a PR thing and people take swipes at us because some people think we're the evil empire, uh, but we don't, there's not a financial incentive there uh, outside of payments. With payments, we're PCI compliant. Uh, the vast majority of our revenue comes through the App Store, and that is going right through Apple and right through Google, and they're obviously mega, mega secure there. So we don't actually have any financial payment information for our customers at all. So it makes us pretty safe on that front. Uh, one good thing about our system is the data set is so big. You're getting, don't quote me exactly, I think many billions of location points uh, per hour. So... If you wanted, if, if you're a hacker and just trying to drain our systems, like the API volumes are so high, it's not like a teenager in a room can just kind of go after someone. Like if you're, unless you can, unless you got someone's keys, you were going to notice it. So observability, like it's actually easy for us because versus a system where you're getting little bits of data here and there, we're like a massive pipe. So um, to make a plumbing analogy, like a slow drip that could run for days in your house, and then you only notice when your floor gets soggy. If a, your main burst, you're going to know instantly. So um, in an oversimplified mm -hmm. way, observability is usually easy for us, in particular around the things that could be more sensitive, such as location, because that's the huge pipe. Uh, and going back to that earlier incident, it seems mm -hmm. like there was some drip on customer service where you could get an email back, but it was not. The, the, if it were the sensitive stuff, it would be very easy for us to see. 
I think it makes a ton of sense. Um, and something you mentioned, Chris, was sort of these marketing ad placements, things like that, targeted uh, ads, you know, in your Form 10K, sort of your annual report for the listeners uh, that might not know that term. Um, at the top, uh, I think a couple pages down, really, it's you've got something called yep. other revenue. And other revenue for the last three years has been around this sort of $25 yep. million dollar a year range. Um, and it's defined as revenue you generate by selling non-identified user data as well as ad placements. So I'm curious, who's yeah. buying this non-identified data? And do you have any examples um, of that? And is it is it all just ads? Is that all it is? Like, sure. what is this data that's that's generating you guys? You yeah, know, 25 so million a it's year? aggregated data, um, and that that might sound like a, a trivial distinction, but it's actually a big one. So we we were using broader data sets to help third parties do things like targeted advertising where it would be de-identified in the user level. Uh, we no longer do that. Uh, we never had any in issues with it, but it did become something that many of our customers, well, actually a very small number of our customers, but it, the, the general sentiment shifted there. And so we thought, you know what, we don't see any problem with it. Going back to my point, I was opted into all this stuff, uh, but it's not worth, and we don't want to do anything that gets in the way of our brand around trust because if we lose the trust of our customers, we're in a lot of trouble because we're, you're trusting us with your family safety. So what we moved to was aggregated only. That means even the partners that get that data could not find out who you are, even if they tried. Uh, and you can get very esoteric. What about this or that or the other? Like you, you really can't. Um, we've offered for anyone to like look at the data set, try to tear it apart. You will not find who these people are, anyone. So it's kind of like we. I'll give you one example. We aggregate on census blocks. So. Uh, we have a company a partner. Uh, we have two exclusive partners. One is Placer.ai, and the other one is Arity, which is an all-state subsidiary. Um, Placer is doing things like aggregated insight. So uh, down to the census block levels, like um, in your census block, people go to McDonald's and 7-Eleven. Uh, they will only give insights, and you have, uh, don't quote me the exact numbers, but I think about 50 people in a census block. So you you can never, there's no GPS lines or trails. And that data is purchased by city planners, hedge funds, mall operators, billboard pla planners. Got it, got it. So they don't, they're not, they're not attri attributing to a user level. Uh, with Arity, it is an all-state subsidiary. On the aggregated basis, they're doing probe data for traffic. So if you get driving directions in an app or your car, it's going to give you traffic. Where, do, where does that traffic come from? Probe data like us. But we're not getting your GPS line. It's saying this intersection had these probes going past it. And we have 13% of all phones in the country running Light 360. So uh, it, people are suddenly surprised to hear that these really nice navigation ETAs, a lot of it is coming from our data. Uh, but again, aggregated, not de-identified, because de-identified still has an individual full line, essentially, but stripped out their name. We don't... Totally. It's like, okay, tell me what's happening at this intersection right now. And again, I'm giving an oversimplified version. Right, right. With Arity, though, what we are trying to do with user permission is um, uh, full opt-in consent so you can get insurance rated, but we will never do that without your permission. Um, and I think that's sometimes misunderstood, uh, sometimes even unintentionally by uh, reporters that I think want to take swipes at companies that use data. Uh, but again, transparency and choice, and out the gate, it's aggregated data, which is, from a legal standpoint, not even a data sale. Uh, even Apple does that. Kind of kind of unrelated here and i just i didn't even write this note down but um i've heard of this and i'm curious what your thoughts on the idea of like a data dividend right it's like opt-in to share your traffic data how often you go to mcdonald's right yeah like you guys are I, using that to generate all this money like have you thought about i passing laugh that down about to the that user? so much because people say that and it's like okay, where do you want me to send your 62 cent check like, do you want your 62 sure. cents? Yeah. Like it's no, like I people it. think like, oh my God, these companies are making so much money off my data. It's like, we, it, it, we're, we're kind of picking up the, 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 the pennies here. Um, not this bad. We have 60, mm -hmm. I've actually not done the math on an MAU basis. We have 60 something million customers. We have 20 million. So we make 33 cents a year per customer on, on our aggregated data. Like that. Okay. <laughs> I get it. I get um, it. So I, I, mean, I don't I don't know if that's a very compelling pitch to get thirty three cents off premium or something. Uh, where it does change though <laughs> is where we where we want to actually give value is like when we do the really detailed stuff like insurance. 
because people pay a lot for that. They're mm. really esoteric rules, right? You can't do rebates legally for insurance, but that is where I think we can pass stuff back to customers uh, where it is sensitive data, but again, transparency and choice. Um, and one thing I think Apple has been helpful with, and it was people were surprised, is that the whole uh, the the pop ups they do give permission for this app to track you across websites. More and more people are actually saying yes to that because I think they understand that targeted ads are good. And so let's not make a value judgment around it. If you want targeted ads, click yes. If you don't want targeted ads, click no. Uh, and there's a little bit more money when you can actually do that attribution. Um, yeah, but I'm I'm tr I'm trying to think how the data dividend would work because if you do the math on really any company, you're 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 not talking about a lot of money. Have you actually heard of people like put a big bigger business model behind that? There's a browser called uh, Brave, and it's tied to yeah. crypto. And the the thesis is you engage with ads proactively to yeah. earn this dividend, which is similar. But it's also I think the flip side of that is are people in the headspace of just trying to make money and not actually, yeah. you know, uh, engaging with yeah. relevant ads. That's one example. I think I, that's heard. a bit different because you're actually engaging the ad and signing up for free trials. And that stuff's been going on since the the nineties. And so I'm, I'm the cheapest person, you know, especially yeah. when I was younger. So I, there was this one thing you like click on ads and offers and you could get like a, I got a free DVD, those portable DVD players in the nineties. I, I, I got one of those by clicking on 20 ads and getting points. And there was a, I also remember a nineties <laughs> company, Right when we got the internet, you could get free dial-up if you had a permanent banner. Do you remember that? Well, you guys are too young. You, I think you'd, you, yeah. you, uh... no, I'm, I think I'm closer to your age, Chris. And I forgot about clicking all the ads okay. to get free stuff. I was a thousand percent yeah. doing that. So that's very so, different. That's you. an active affirmative step. You're giving someone a credit card and signing up for a trial. Very different than exhaust data, which yeah. it is. You're, you're, you're collecting lots and lots of pennies over millions of customers. Um, but that's kind of going like I'd love to toss stuff back to our customers um, if we can. Insurance, there are weird legal things around that. But, yeah, if someone's actually signing up for a trial or something, like um, we, then, yeah, for sure. There's, that's where there's real dollars. And uh, not the question you asked, but when we've looked at in launching ads, I think the market has maybe oversimplified the ads opportunity in the short run, but underestimated it in the long run, because we do with your data, with your permission, we can really target some pretty powerful life events and help you. Like when you go to a new school, get a new car, get a phone, uh, all these things are moments where there's significant purchases happening. Uh, and I would love to give people offers. Hey, welcome to a, Welcome a new neighborhood. Here's a discount on home security. We could pass a huge chunk of that back to our customers. Uh, and if this is coming from Life360, which you know and trust, uh, I, I think that that's very exciting. But that's going to take a while to really get those hooks in place. Because uh, I think the, the leap from this, like, this dull banner to a real offer that's valuable is a lot. And you also have, it's not just the offer, but how do you build up that trust and awareness? Because I think as we all know, the vast majority of banners are like, oh, you can save up to 37%. Like, no, you're just giving me a BS ad. So how do we build that trust where it's like, no, we're, hey, Katie, here's here's how you drive. Here's your driver's score. Don't opt into this until it's good. But when it's good, like, man, this is going to help you. Like that, I think, is going to be yeah. really powerful, especially if our customers trust us that yeah. we're being smart around actually telling them ahead of time how their data is going to be used for or against them. And if it's against them, like, don't do it. So shifting to your, your audience, I know you have a hybrid sort of audience where you have yep. paying members, you have free members. Can you break down what are the paying members getting? What are the free members yep. getting or not getting? Um, and how does monetization work across all sure, of Sure. Let's things? just take U.S. only for the moment. Eventually, it will all be international, but just to simplify. So the core free experience, you get almost all our location services for free. We put a few paywalls up, but we really wanted to be the disruptor, not the, the, uh, not the disruptee. So we, we're pretty liberal around what we give our customers. Uh, and you also get some very basic driving features for free and things like an automated SOS, an automated crash detection system where we get in a crash and we uh, notify your family, don't call 911 for you. So it's kind of like the free version is kind of like what Apple does. The paid version, uh, and most people get our gold tier, it's much broader. The, the anchor product is what we call driver protect. Roadside assistance like AAA, reports on how your family members are driving, and human-assisted crash detection like OnStar. Beyond that, we offer uh, emergency travel and disaster assistance. We have identity theft protection, dark web monitoring. It's a pretty uh, a stolen phone protection. So it's a pretty broad membership. 
Right now, that is very focused on families with teens. The goal, though, is how do we have different services for all life stages over time? So from the time you don't even have kids to aging parents, uh, Life360 wants to have a service for you. And the really exciting thing about our model is we grow word of mouth, so we have a very low marketing cost. In most products in the safety space, marketing is their number one cost, and we just don't have that. So uh, if you were to take everything you get in our gold bundle or, or platinum bundle, which also comes with a few tiles, it would cost you probably literally 10 times as much to piece those services together individually. Uh, and, and we can do it because we have mobile economics. Like we have this great interface that we can naturally stack everything up into. And over time, that's going to expand. So uh, about, I think it's 13% of our U.S. customers are paying us right now. We think that can probably double over time, so 30%. And if you think about how that can ramp up our revenue, if we double free users, uh, we've doubled revenue 600 million. If we double percent of people pay us, we're at 1.2 billion. If we can double how much money we make through things like using your data and, and, and privacy safe and opt-in ways, doubled again, we'd be at 2.4 billion. So that, that's sort of how we pitch the upside to investors is like with it, a lot has to go well for that to happen, but it's not any crazy step function. Uh, also not the question you asked, but one thing that's a bit of a misperception around Life360 is that our users are all families with teens. Uh, in fact, only about in the mid or high 30s of our percents of our customers have teens living at home. Paid users are a bit different. It is more than half uh, are, are that stereotype people have of us. But it shows we have the user base that's already kind of there from cradle to grave. Uh, and we have these very natural plug-in moments. So it's, uh, and I think we have been the tortoise, not the hare, because we've yet going, our user base is growing bigger and bigger. We're not a victim of our own success in a, in a, in a way that, you know, the dating apps, which is an interesting comp for us, are. I love that. And to the point of, um, you know, from, you think said cradle to yeah. the grave. I, I like that because on, on one side of the equation, you're completely right. Everyone on the internet thinks that this is the helicopter parent team yep. app that's going to make sure that, you know, you're not speeding, you are home when you need to be home, whatever it is, where I'm on the opposite side of the spectrum. My dad's almost 80 years old, and I'm thinking about now using Life360 as a way to get a better handle on how he's spending sure. his day-to-day -day activity out yeah, my, of the house. So yeah. talk about that a little bit, especially as it relates to all these baby boomers. I think it's, what, 4 million baby boomers uh, turn 65 every year, you know, sort of the silver tsunamis around the corner. Yeah, well, so I, I can that, I, unfortunately comment on that very personally, because my mom is uh, early to mid-stages of dementia, uh, and... Uh, not surprising because it runs in the family. Happened a little bit earlier than I wanted. Um, but my mom has been a Life360 user in the beginning, and she also didn't get the product at first. But then as soon as she used it, she just became a huge fan. Uh, but now that she's had these cognitive issues kick in, uh, we were watching her drive, and it's like, oh, man, like we might want to take the car away. And we actually brought the Life360 driving reports to the neurologist, and um, we had the neurologist report my own mom to pull her license. Um so that's one use of it. But when she was in this twilight zone, it was very reassuring to know that, like, if something were to happen while she was on the road, we would get notified. And, and it was that tool to have that conversation. Uh, and now we use the product to make sure she's home at night because she walks around. Unfortunately, it's not there yet. But you can see in a few years, unfortunately, it's going to get worse. And we have plans for the software and hardware features for seniors. So think about the software feature for seniors at home. It's not the hard to say. When was the phone last active? Like for a teen, like last act was going to be like three seconds ago. But for like a senior, it's like oh, they yeah. got out of bed. They use the phone. That's like a really good indicator. How many steps they're doing. Tap into the health. How's their gait? Uh, fall detection. And then we own Tile and Geobit. Doing a senior care product is really not that hard. And it's a, a terribly antiquated industry. And so we think we can win from a product standpoint and just a acquisition standpoint. Seniors love Beyond Life 360 because it doesn't feel like they're not part of the family and we're just going to be better at products it's like been these really old school like more marketing focused companies that dominated the space and we've also um really have we built the interface of changing topics a little bit and maybe to the misperception people have about us a lot of our competitors early on were intentionally helicopter parents i remember we had this one competitor they called themselves mama bear it might still look like oh my god you guys branding is horrible like, oh my come gosh on. I, I, was, I was just laughing about <laughs> that because like but it's so but weird. there's the kid version the parent version like some, and yeah. we have always been like there is no kid version and parent version we treat people as peers on the system 
Uh, and then the funniest stuff is usually the kids actually telling the parents they're driving too fast. And we have things like bubbles. You can hide yourself from your family and, and you have to pop the bubble in an emergency. And you, you get all the safety features with the privacy. Uh, so I, I've been on TikTok telling teens how to break the app. So we are fully opt in. Um, we are, we have every time we've had requests from Michigan, can you tell me the kids uninstalling? Can you lock down? It's like, nope, go to a different product because we knew the big win was being something that everybody wants to be on. Uh, and we had a thesis, which was proven right, which is like location just fades to the background if it's used appropriately. Um, the thing that went even further than that, which I'm a little shocked by and is probably not good for society, is the COVID kid generation of the teens that were like locked down for the last few years are now getting their freedom. They're the ones bringing their parents into Life360. That, I will admit, I never thought would happen because uh, they are so used to uh. that like mommy, daddy being right there. Um it's crazy to me. So I, I think there is a problem of kids needing independence, but I, but we're genuinely, um, we want kids to have more freedom. And I, and I think most people think that's corporate speak, but like, look at our numbers. It's not like when people use the product, like, oh, I get it. It's actually, it sounds like Austin, you're using it with aging parents. It's, it's not a tracker tool. Yes, we've, we've had over a hundred million downloads. Of, we've heard every example known to man, but on average, it's the people who stick, the people who engage, they're not using it. Uh, as helicopter parents or people track or control people. Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, it's because right now I've got what, like the find my iPhone. It's yep. the only way I'm tracking my dad. He wears like yep. one of those like necklaces or something. But I, all I get is a text message yep. if he clicks it, right? And it's from this automated who knows what happened. So I don't know. I think that's a really cool opportunity. And I'm, I'm eager yeah, to see sure. how that grows for you guys over the future. Kind of, you know, shifting gears here away from the financials and, and sort of the numbers is, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about your leadership style, yep. your company's core values. Um, one of those core values is members over metrics yep. we want to start with like how does this benefit members before we hit on what metric it's moving and that's been an extremely tough thing to instill especially as we've gotten bigger uh the especially being public the financial pressures are immense and mm -hmm. and and the short-term thinking is a real thing and I think most companies lose sight of if you build a good product, if you care about your customers, good thing will happen. Uh, because like, oh, we're up to a quarter, our back's against the wall, we're making trade-offs. And hey, we, we make trade-offs all the time. I do not give us an A on that value. I give us a B at best. Um, but every day we want to be coming in, fighting for customers and really thinking like, is this the right long-term move? Let's make sure we're not optimized local maximums. Let's not sure we're just prematurely harvesting customers. We want people to feel like they're getting a good deal. I'm probably a little bit of a purist, and so I let the team push me a bit. But I, I think it's game over for a business like ours if if we lose sight of, like, we're a product company, and we're a free product company, and we're going up against free alternatives now. We have to be that much more delightful. Uh, and again, haven't been perfect, but we've been better than most, and I think that is why we have excelled in the category, especially early on when we had some competitors that weren't as obsessive of just this thing cannot break. It has to work. Every bug must be hunted down. If we see a battery report of killing a battery, we need to figure out why. Um, so it's tough and it's exhausting, but it's important to us. I think that's, that's yeah. amazing. And it, it speaks volume to, you know, why you guys now have over 2 million paid members. I mean, it certainly, um, you know, exceeded Wall yep. Street's expectations. I think they weren't expecting you guys to hit that for a couple more months. So congrats on that awesome Thanks. achievement. Want to shift to TikTok and teens, which you alluded yep. to, and something we've talked about on this show, uh, just the influence of young people in online channels. We actually, one of our first shows, we had the CEO of Celsius on. They recently are under some fire because there's all this misinformation on TikTok saying there's cyanide oh in the God. drinks. And um, I know you, you know, you joined TikTok as a result of some sort of like campaign against you. And I want, I just want to hear about that experience, what you learned from it and, and how you're using the platform either as a leader or a company now to sort of get ahead of that influence. Yep. So to back up, the fun, I was at a friend's house and they had teenage kids. And like, are you the TikTok guy? I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, I don't have a TikTok account. 
It's like, no, you, you're the TikTok guy. And they pulled out a video, and there was a meme of people searching for who, who creator of Life 360. They find me, and they pull out a knife and pretend to beat me up. I'm like, oh, geez. Uh, so I was like, okay, this is going kind of big. And that was like a 100 million views. And at first, I was a little bit nervous because all it takes is one crazy person who doesn't get that it's a joke. Uh, and that was okay. Yeah. We just ignored it. And then there was an account that they were trying to do a one-star campaign and spread the false rumor that if a app is rated one star, it's pulled off the app store. Um, anyone who can do average math says it's impossible to have a one-star rated app, even have a single five-star, because all it takes is one. So it was just not true to begin with. Um, and it, it, we got like 300,000 one-star reviews in a day. It, but instead of being all upset about it, and we are we are legal team, like, we're going to sue everybody or whatever. We, we just like, what if we actually reach out to the <laughs> yeah. to the teens and try to befriend them? Um, and of course, it, we we were big enough to have corporate antibodies. I was told why that was a bad idea. Just, yeah, what's the downside? So we actually found the teens. They didn't reply to me on TikTok. They replied to me on Twitter, and I just actually congratulated them because um, like I, I wasn't mad. They're sixteen, <laughs> and uh, I probably did way stupider stuff when I was. Younger, and then actually turned out they didn't really even dislike Life 360. It was kind of funny. Yeah, their parents would be fun, like a little over the top with it, and it was during COVID, and I was sitting at home. Yeah. So we said like, why don't we just team up? And like, I kind of gave the story. I think people assumed I was going to be some very stodgy, much older person. Um, I'm 40 now, so I was like in my mid 30s when this all happened. Uh, so so not not a teenager, but not an old man either. Um, and I was, I've was i been the biggest rule breaker my entire life, which also surprises people. Uh, so I thought, like, why don't we kind of just go out there and be really self-deprecating? Maybe this whole fake story that I got fired by the board and I was going to try to be a teen influencer. And <laughs> once I put on, like, a little belly shirt and uh, tried to, like, did T-shirt tie-dye and I let my hair grow out because I was depressed in theory. And and, and and people bounce back and forth of actually believing it. And people believe everything. It's like, um, and uh it was just funny, but I just made a fool out of myself by design. But then we did do a hashtag challenge when TikTok still hadn't got huge yet. We we bought the homepage of TikTok. I think it was like three hundred grand, which is a lot of money. But like now to buy the homepage of TikTok is probably some oh, yeah. crazy amount of money. But we announced the, yeah. the launch of our bubbles feature. We called it Ghost Mode. So you could swipe. We made a filter. You could swipe and disappear. So like, look, we want you to use this for freedom. We've made a feature that it like. You can not share your location, but it's there for safety and essentially blame your parents so they use it poorly, but don't blame us. And if we go away, a company that actually doesn't care, like the mama bear is going to take our place. So be careful what you ask for. That got over 7 billion <laughs> views on the hashtag. It was like one of the most wow. successful hashtag Whoa. campaigns ever. Um, and then it's p petered out a little bit, but I was like, it was a very weird feeling like teens would come up and stop me all the time. And they'd seen the TikToks and we went from... I don't think we were actually hated. I mean, some of them did, but to actually like, did, they, they kind of got the high fives and they kind of just, yeah, you guys annoy me sometimes, but they were, um, now they feel like members too. They like it. Uh, and then teens started asking, the, especially the COVID kids started asking their parents to use Life360. And so uh, TikTok is, uh, I, I've mm -hmm. hung up the cleats. I haven't posted in probably a year. Uh, you can find the paintball video if you want. Um, we can send it to you or go to my TikTok. It's Life360 CEO. Uh, but I have passed the baton to our team, and they're doing an excellent job now. Uh, they they have surpassed me in followers and videos. And a lot of what we do is we make fun of ourselves. And we even tell teens how to break the app. I will tell any teenager how to break the app and hide from their parents because we're not trying to force the app on anybody. Um, and I think people believe us now, and, and, it, and it was true. So uh, being authentic and engaging and, and, and not hiding behind kind of like corporate brand handlers uh, – is how you how you do well on social media and, and i think one of the benefits that we are still a founder-led company is i i have the spiritual authority to break these rules and take these risks where i think if we, if there were a board hired ceo it'd just be a little bit weirder because i i know why i started the company i know why we exist and i i i i have the credibility to say that and when i want to be goofy i i can and i think that's really helped us and now we get to these huge TikTok surges and downloads um and it's, it turned into this thing for a while. Like, oh, my God, even though it was sort of a joke with these one stars, it was very bad to like now it's a, it's a great acquisition channel for us and brand tool. And again, for the teams, there, there are members, too. Wow. That is a crazy experience. And I love the haircut. Haircut looks good on your man. I'll tell you what, the long hair, it was it See was that bobble head long. <laughs> behind me, the, the, the team made that for me to, to commemorate the long hair. Um, 
Chris, you're now the third guest on our show who has served in a military in some capacity. And it's really interesting to see that trend across the shows we've had and such a large share of executives we're talking to have that background. Um, and I'm curious, what is it about those experiences that kind of built you as a leader? And what about those experiences do you think mold someone to, to lead a public yeah, company? I, so I was enlisted. I joined when I was 17, which I think is a little bit abnormal. Most, um, most execs usually had gone after college and were officers. So I was not in a leadership position in the military. I think in terms of what it did for me, I grew up on the periphery of Silicon Valley in Marin County, which is right north of San Francisco. So when I think about the military, it got me out of this bubble I grew up. And I didn't grow up wealthy. I was in a small town, um, but it was still in the valley, so to speak. So getting out of that kind of coastal zone and seeing what the rest of the world was like. But I think there's one thing, the, and I was not a good military member. I was always a troublemaker, but I got my honorable, paid for my college, all that. If you are in the military, there are no excuses. And if something needs to be done, it gets done. And I had pretty bad grades in high school. They're not bad, but they were, you know, I could get A's on tests, but I never did my homework. If you are a teenager that needs that kick in the butt around discipline, like the military is great. You don't complain. I think in some ways it's good to be at the bottom because you just learn that nothing's beneath you. And in the early days of a startup in particular, it's a freaking slog. And I think a lot of people I've met and even employees, they went to Harvard or Stanford or whatever, and they succeeded by going, ticking boxes where the, the problem is very well defined, but like it's sort of different than just like you figure out how to get things done, period. So I, I think being in a bit more, even the military is also very procedural, like just a no excuse mindset really helped me and helped me grow up a little bit in a way that has translated. Sounds like the military taught you, of course, the no excuse mindset, but also how to be pretty resourceful. I don't know if the military is resourceful in terms of just, um, I was a grunt basically. So you just do whatever. And and, and I, and I, and just maybe the resilience piece was there. And then being outside mm -hmm. of like, kind of, I was in Arkansas for a few years. I, I was able to see a very different part of the country and I don't think one is better or worse, but they're, they're very different. And that was helpful. Cause I, I think a lot of people that have, especially grew up a lot, a lot of entrepreneurs grew up with wealthy families. Cause it's, it's, it's a, you take a lot of risk to start a company. And if you're, if you have those resources easier, I, I think it's, been helpful that I did not have that background and I was able to see the rest of the world and, and have that maybe a little bit more of a struggle. I love that perspective. Chris, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of After Earnings. Everyone, if you do not have Life360 on your phone, here's your chance. Download the app and follow Chris here on TikTok to get all the behind the scenes and maybe you'll see a video we'll of him getting uh, shot by paintballs. You'll see all the welts too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Austin, I'm not going to lie. That was not what I was expecting from the CEO of a safety and security company. What were your takeaways from our chat with Chris? Yeah, I feel like that conversation was one of those that I'd have in like a backyard around a fire pit, like holding a beer. He just seems like <laughs> such a homie. So shout out to Chris. What an awesome guy. Um, three things stood out to me. The first one was the members before metrics or members over metrics, one of the core values there. Um, and how important it is to them to say like, you know, we don't care to introduce specific, you know, products or business segments that are specifically going to try and move the needle from a financial perspective, but instead, like, how is this product going to help people's lives, right? How is it going to provide safety? How is it going to provide a sense of calmness and peace knowing, you know, where someone might be or what they might be doing or, you know, back to the idea he mentioned insurance offers a lot, these targeted ads, right? I think that's a really cool sort of mentality and a good core value for this company. Um, obviously, they're now listed on the NASDAQ. I think that's really exciting, um, especially as a company. You know, he mentioned how whenever they started trading on the ASX, they had a, what was it, 30 million? I think he quoted um, in annual revenue there. Now they're doing 300 million. So they're a much larger company now, a lot of momentum behind them. And now they just, you know, they launched five new languages across the world. I think that's going to add about 10% more uh, to their total addressable market, which is really cool. And then finally, talking about the opportunity 
for boomers and just old people in general, right? I think you know when, when I hear Life 360, I immediately think about the teenagers on TikTok, maybe the people who are maybe in college, but it's, it's a way for parents to figure out what's going on with their children. But as I get older, I'm 28 now, my dad is in his late 70s, right? There is not a good solution for people like me who are technologically uh, capable to keep an eye on their older parents. And I think as more and more Gen Z millennials and you know people of that age cohort begin to experience aging parents, Life360 might be the solution they depend on to uh, you know keep an eye on them and, and make sure things are moving in the right direction. So you know I think there's a massive opportunity from that perspective as well i love the conversation shout out to chris really glad he cut his hair (laughs) it was pretty long there on tiktok for a bit but katie what'd you think yeah i mean i i'm just trying to wrap my head around some of these teenagers like ripping them a new one on tiktok that might be in 10 to 15 years paying subscribers to life 360 um and i i just love the candor talking about you know he got personally called out on tiktok um and he embraced it and he sort of got right in there, got in the mix and started engaging with these kids and actually shared about teaching them how to sort of hack the platform or use the platform to track their parents and how fast they're driving. So (laughs) I thought that was super refreshing. It's just not what I was expecting from the CEO of a publicly traded company that, that deals with this kind of data. I also thought he was just super down to earth. I mean, he rolled into the interview with a 7-Eleven cup. That's just not something we usually get on this show. But, you know, out in the world, that's what normal people drink for coffee. And he shared about kind of how his background was unconventional. He enlisted in the military before college at 17. He's lived in places like Arkansas. And he's not one of these founders that's sort of born out of the the bubble in these coastal areas that sometimes don't have the perspective of how real Americans or real people live around the world. So I thought that was fascinating. And again, just not something you get a lot from someone at his level. So all in all, great conversation, very entertained, very informed about the company. We hope Chris comes back on the show soon. And with that, this was After Earnings, the show brought to you by Morning Brew and Stakeholder Labs. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe. And maybe download the Life360 app if you are a helicopter parent. (laughs) Thanks, guys. We'll see you on the next episode.